Welcome, welcome. Welcome, welcome, and sorry for that slight delay. Um, good morning and welcome to the virtual seminar series organized by the NUS Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions. I'm Dr. Kelly Simon, your host for today's panel. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow with the Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions, and it's my pleasure to be the moderator for today's webinar on green recovery and just transition. Before we begin, I would like to announce two housekeeping details. Uh, first, we would like to congratulate Dr. Simon Skilbeek, one of our speakers who welcomed twins into the world. So congratulations on your unending joy and exhaustion that you've just found. In addition, during the seminar, please keep your microphones muted to avoid audio interference. Please note that this session is recorded and will be posted on YouTube later, both on our CNCS channel, as well as Bard University's Solve Climate by 2030. So Stanley, can you please advance the slide? And next one, please, thank you. So the NUS Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions is a newly established exactly one year ago this month. It aims to empower public and private sector leaders in Singapore and Asia to respond appropriately and decisively to climate change. Ultimately, this is for achieving a carbon neutral economy and stable global climate. The center has two key mandates. First, to build the evidence base on climate, climate science for informing policy, strategy, and action. Second mandate is to build capacity in academic, government, and corporate sector leaders. I'm pleased to present this exciting and unique panel for you today. The panel is not only part of our regular seminar series, but the theme and the timing is being done in collaboration with Bard College's Solve Climate by 2030. NUS CNCS is one of over 120 universities in over 50 countries and a countless number of classrooms that are hashtag making climate a class. This week, on the universal theme of green recovery and a just transition. So by now we're all very familiar with COVID over the past year, unprecedented economic disruption with the global economy starting to slowly back up. There's a focus on green recovery and a just transition. A just transition links 14 out of 17 sustainable development goals. We will now have a brief introduction and video by the founder of Solve Climate by 2030, Dr. Ivan Goodstein. Stanley? Welcome to the Solve Climate Global Dialogues. You're participating in one of 125 events held across the planet, including in almost all 50 US states, part of a global project called Solve Climate by 2030. My name is Evan Goodstein, and I'm an economist and director of the Graduate Programs in Sustainability at Bard College in New York, the lead organizer for Solve Climate. This last year has been difficult for everyone. As the world looks forward to recovery from COVID, we are focusing tonight on the most important question facing humanity. What can we do in this year in our regions to help solve climate change while supporting struggling communities that have faced widespread loss of life, economic disaster, and joblessness? Worldwide, from Australia to Kyrgyzstan, from Colombia to Malaysia, and from South Carolina to South Africa, Solve Climate audiences are hearing from local experts and young leaders about concrete steps that can really help nations solve climate change while creating much needed jobs and incomes for everybody. The year 2020 was one of the two hottest years in human history, bringing with it massive forest and grassland fires, record-breaking storms and hurricanes, and relentless rising seas. Solving climate is the challenge which the human species must now face. There's hope for the future. Solutions have continued to advance. This year, China committed to building a carbon neutral economy while the US rejoined the Paris Agreement. Solar, wind, and battery prices continue to fall while major car companies have been rushing to electrify the global fleet. Worldwide, movements for Black Lives Matter and Me Too are leading in bringing much delayed and urgently needed justice to the world. Time is short. We have until 2030, 10 years to solve climate. We can get a lot done in this decade. We have the solutions, but only if we focus the world on climate solutions and justice, and then do the work we have to do in our own cities and regions. For students listening, you are the leaders. Without you, the future we envision will not come. I'm asking tonight for your help. We're gonna discover powerful ideas for climate solutions and climate justice and how you can be a part of the solution. But this message must reach beyond those of us who are listening right now. 
Would you ask all your teachers this week in every subject to make climate a class? The teacher can assign tonight's webinars homework for the students and then afterwards have a one class period discussion. And we mean every subject from art to engineering, psychology. Thank you, Stanley. <laughs> That's okay, so it looks like the video cut out briefly, but the sentiment is there that um, all over the world, there are classes from high school, middle school, elementary, all the way up to university level, as well as these webinars that are all focusing on the same issue at the same time. So to make climate a class and a just recovery, just transition and a green recovery. So today we have an excellent panel of three interdisciplinary speakers from energy policy to green finance and the private sector. And it's sure to spark some lively dialogue. They are Ms. Melissa Lowe. Melissa is a research fellow at the NUS Energy Studies Institute. Current research focuses on transparency of climate change action and reporting in Southeast Asia. Mr. Tony Chan is the Associate Planner Lead for Southeast Asia for Arab, which is instrumental in engineering and sustainability projects all over the world. And finally, Dr. Simon Skilabeeks, an assistant professor at the Lee Chan School of Business at Singapore Management University, as well as a serial social entrepreneur. A very warm welcome to the panel, and we are excited to have all of you here. Afterwards, we'll have a 10-minute discussion and Q&A. If you have any questions for our panelists during this event, please submit them to the poll EV at the link in the chat. You can upvote questions from others there as well, and the link, again, posted in the chat. Our first speaker is Melissa Lowe. Melissa is a research fellow at the NUS Energy Studies Institute. She holds a master's of law with distinction in climate change and law, a master's of environmental management, and an honor as in bachelor's of, of geography. She has participated in UFCCC COPs for over a decade and is an active sustainability thought leader communicating the science in a variety of formats from presentations to scientific journals to a number of forums. Her current research focuses on transparency of climate change action and reporting for Southeast Asia. So Melissa, please take it away. Thanks, Kelly. Um, good afternoon, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all who are joining us. Thank you so much to Kelly for the introduction and the NUS Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions for inviting me to be on this panel. Uh, I'm looking forward to the other panelists, uh, Tony and Simon's remarks later and a lively discussion on this topic. Um, this morning, I'd like to focus my short remarks on what a green recovery means for Singapore. Uh, as all of you know, COVID-19 has been a shock to the global economy. The country is already demonstrating their commitment to addressing the ongoing climate crisis while look, working to contain the virus and to manage its impacts. Countries around the world are looking to build back better and to ensure a green recovery. But it remains to be seen what this will look like in practice. In broad terms, a green recovery might mean an aggressive shift away from fossil fuels. But for Singapore, it can be much more than that. It means building up capabilities for a competitive and sustainable low carbon future. The goal as we navigate through this pandemic should be to ensure an inclusive and just climate resilient transition. The Singapore government moved quickly to ensure that these plans are on paper and on track. In March 2020, just as the pandemic was, was um, um, you know, growing, Singapore submitted its enhanced national determined, nationally determined contribution to peak emissions at 65 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent around 2030 and its long-term low emissions development strategy to halve emissions from its 2030 peak from 65 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent to 33 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent by 2050 with a view to achieving net zero emissions as soon as viable in the second half of the century. Major fiscal packages were created this drew down nearly 100 billion Singapore dollars uh, from past reserves in the financial year to help Singaporeans tide over and to position the country for future growth uh, and to support a competitive transition to a greener future. Uh, as many of you know, the Ministry of Sustainability and the Environment, um, formerly known as the Ministry of Environment and Water Resources, uh, has said it plans to create some 4,000 new and upgraded green jobs in 2021 and 55,000 over the next decade as Singapore pursues sustainable development. Jobs are likely to open up in the environmental services, the food and agri-technology industries, as Singapore hopes to enhance food security amid the pandemic as well. In, 20, in, in February of this year, the Singapore Parliament unanimously passed the motion that acknowledged the seriousness of the global threat of climate change and called for action. 
This led to the announcement of the Singapore Green Plan 2030. The 10-year plan sets goals for Singapore that is said to strengthen ongoing efforts by the Singapore government to implement commitments under the UN's 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda and the Paris Agreement. These questions remain, however. Does Singapore have the deep expertise in climate science and environmental technologies to operationalize the Green Plan and to reduce emissions at the scale and speed that is necessary? Is expertise enough to ensure a smooth green recovery? Realistically, reducing emissions in an absolute fashion is challenging for Singapore. I think many of you are aware of this and the trade-offs. But as companies here pivot away from fossil fuels and towards lower carbon alternative, uh, job cuts and the need to retrain workers to go into other industries are now a reality. It will need to be addressed and quickly. Identifying retrenched workers from fossil related industries and ascertaining their desire to be reskilled into other jobs is a challenging task. Much depends on the role of these workers and whether their skill sets are transferable, for, uh, say, for instance, uh, for instance, to the clean energy sector. A green recovery can only happen if we aggressively develop capabilities and expertise for both immediate and long term needs so that we can be at the forefront of green innovation. One thing that can happen right now is to prepare our educational institutions, families, individuals for the change that is happening and coming. Everyone needs to be on board with the message that green collar jobs and clean economic recovery is essential to building back better and achieving our climate goals. COVID-19 has also revealed that society places emphasis on measures of success that go beyond GDP growth, including happiness, health, equality for citizens and non-citizens alike. So instead of only saying that we need to create jobs and lay the foundation for future growth and improve long-term competitiveness, Singapore uh, and all of us, we should also qualify that these jobs should be inclusive, that they take into consideration Singapore's position on climate change. We must not shy away from difficult conversations. Singapore is small, uh, we are open, we're trade dependent. And so we should expect trade-offs um, such as those that require us to choose between economic growth, sustaining middle income jobs and emissions reductions. These are some hard truths that we have to face, but the key is to have those important conversations and to find those innovative solutions together. We must do this if we want our recovery to be truly inclusive. And so to conclude, um, while it is the government's priority to create jobs, strengthen social safety nets during this unprecedented crisis, everyone has a part to play in creating the right environment to develop the pipeline of inclusive and climate resilient jobs and competitive advantages so that Singapore will continue to survive, not just survive, uh, but also to thrive using less resources for a low carbon future to become reality. And green recovery doesn't mean anything if we come out of this pandemic with the same mindset and actions as before. As a society, we should begin to think critically and act more consciously so as to recover better. And with that, I conclude my remarks and look forward to the discussion ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa, really insightful. And, and I think that's a really excellent segue for our, our next speaker as well. I'm excited to have Mr. Tony Chan with us to provide a unique private sector uh, point of view. Tony has degrees in town planning and sustainable development, in addition to postgrad degrees in business economic and project management. His expertise lies in delivering multidisciplinary projects in an integrated and very systemic manner. This includes developing master planning and urban design with associate water strategies such as energy, water, transportation, all to address natural resource consumption. So very interested to hear how Tony and Arup are moving forward during this time. Tony? Thanks a lot, Kelly. And I think it's a, obviously it's a big, big issue for us to deal with, as you heard from Melissa, right, from, uh, from a country city-state perspective. It's challenging enough because, you know, Singapore itself, in terms of primary emission, I think 40 odd percent is from the energy supply, which is, is natural gas, almost fully natural gas. And then the other 40 odd percent uh, from the oil, gas and petrochemicals sort of industry. So it's challenging in that primary emission aspect. And what we're able to do from the built environment aspect, especially buildings and the number of buildings we're involved with, it's from the secondary emissions side. I'll, I'll, I'll share my screen and share some of the projects we're doing, but the task at hand is immense uh, for, for all of us. Is my screen being shared, Kelly? Yeah. Yes, you're good, Tony. Okay. So for us, um, well, I'm with uh, Arab and 
as a just as a company background, it's slightly different in the sense that we are fully employee owned globally, and although we have to be profitable, ultimately the the principle behind everything we do is all purpose driven. Um, this year's strategy, global strategy for us is that we have to push harder from the sustainability aspect and climate resiliency and lowering of carbon is a prime uh, objective for us to, to do in all our projects uh, this year. As you know, last year tied with uh, 2016 as the hottest year's year on record. And as, as you can see, uh, based on the chart, right, is rising uh, drastically every year. And that's scary as well. If you know, the, this is commonly used uh, as an image in, in when talking about uh, glacier ice retreat, uh, Mendel Hall Glacier in Alaska in 58, at the same time of the year, and how much it, it has retreated in 2011. I was there in 2019, we did a family uh, cruise there. <laughs> it's retreated even, even further. So right before, you know, my own eyes, rather than just seeing through screens or looking at photos in the past, how much the glacial ice has uh, retreated. Of all the countries that sign up to the Paris Agreement, right, only two countries' plans are uh, on track to hit the 1.5 degree mark, Morocco and Gambia. And those are just plans to hit it, right? But, you know, they may not even hit it itself. So everyone is clearly not on track to hit the 1.5 uh, degrees mark. Same, same for where we're heading for Singapore as well. A lot of it is uh, down to energy. And despite you know, the energy demand dropping uh, last year, we all know it's only temporary. It's gonna pick, it, pick up again uh, post COVID. And then when even the UN are stating that countries are projected to produce twice the limit on all gas and coal requirements to hit the Paris Agreement. And despite all what the oil companies are saying, uh, when you look at the numbers, only 1% of their revenue is directed to, towards non-coal uh, products. So essentially it's still business as usual for many of the oil, gas and coal companies despite all the uh, different words they're putting out, out there at the moment. So when we're looking at, because fossil fuel is the main, main issue we have to deal with, um, you can see production is, is moving upwards rather than downwards where uh, it has to be, to be consistent with the Paris, Paris Agreement. Where we're able to influence on the built environment side and Within Arab and personally, we are not going far enough. Uh, we have to push a lot harder. Um, and it's a collective uh, effort where we're able to influence and where uh, policymakers, et cetera, are able to influence. We see many efforts being done to, to adapt uh, to this changing climate. A lot of things being done, especially you see around Singapore, lots of uh, trees being planted on green buildings, uh, on buildings to minimize heat island effects. Uh, this is a project uh, just to the north west of Singapore, where lots of planting on tree uh, building tops, etc. And it's all fine and well, but where where we're going is clearly not on track, right? What what do cities look like in the future? Are we going to be building uh, buildings that and and districts that float to adapt to a changing climate? We've seen this in the past, uh, Lake Titicaca in in Mexico where they're adapting to the environment they are in. In Krabi in Thailand, you see floating villages and they have uh, football fields on, on water, et cetera. Uh, we are using the UN SDG and obviously the planetary framework as guiding uh, documents and guiding principles around how, how we do things. We always map it against what we are achieving from the UN SDG perspective. Um, we, we did the city resilience framework for the 100 resilient cities program. I'm actually working with the ADB at the moment and using this framework to see how cities are built up in a more resilient manner uh, across Asia. We are working with C40 on tackling uh, carbon uh, with a number of cities around the world. We are co-developing strategic uh, research with them uh, on focus on carbon reduction. 
digital, as you know, is an enabler. So we are trying to use digital and smart um, technologies more to enable those objectives to reduce, reduce carbon. This was one of the first projects, being a master planner, and why I was attracted to Arab uh, all those years before was this project, which actually decides just drawing a master plan and making sure that it looks pretty on plan. I think this was one, one of the first projects where we tried to pull everything together. So we were modeling resource consumption. We want to make sure that there's a, a zero carbon within the city itself. Uh, we were mapping uh, resource flows and seeing if when we move land users around, what does it mean in terms of resource consumption, what it means for energy consumption, etc. Uh, some of the tools we use when we are trying to map uh, those resource flows uh, as, as we plan uh, the city. And this was the final uh, result. It's only been partly implemented for a variety of reasons in Shanghai, political change, uh, objectives being different. And we are also trying to address the wetland uh, to, the, to the east of the project. And so as of today, it's only a partial, par partial part of it has been, has been implemented. And this was a diagram at the end. So as a, as a learning from that project, there were a lot of challenges because the policies were just not in place to make sure that we forced through the targets we wanted. So when we were trying to talk about renewables and all that, uh, from an energy supply perspective in China, there's nothing that local government or even provincial government are able to do to force that change because the the state grid, et cetera, are just not going to move on what they've been planning all the while. So what we tried to do was also to make sure that we push through um, energy targets and water targets directly into the zoning plans. In China, the guidelines doesn't mean anything because the developers that come on board, all they're going to follow is the zoning plan and the land lease condition. So guidelines to them doesn't mean anything. They can just throw it out the door. So where we were trying to affect change was pushing energy targets directly into the zoning plan. Not as easy in China, because if you change it in China, you're essentially changing it for the whole country. It doesn't have a system like, uh, like uh, Australia or UK, where you have local councils approving plans. This has to be changed at the national level. So for this project in Beijing, we actually map all the KPIs, especially on energy and water, and then we force it through into the zoning plan itself. So we had to model to make sure that there's enough um, renewable energy to hit those targets we wanted. In this case, it was coming from solar as well as uh, um, ground source uh, heated water coming out from, from the ground. So we're putting targets into the zoning plan itself multiple awards, they got pushed through, and now such zoning plans can be produced all over China, and the project itself won uh, multiple national as well as global uh, planning awards. We also tried to incorporate uh, C40's Climate Positive Development Program, and the first one that was done in China was a uh, redevelopment of an industrial site for the um, National Capital Steel Project. So, they were decommissioning the, the plant and then now it's a mixed use uh, zone. So that was done together with uh, C40. If you've been to Shanghai for the World Expo, post the World Expo uh, and some in, in this part of the project, we were also trying to push through um, new targets, sustainable targets they're, they're able to hit. I think things like renewable energy ratio, the amount of water being reused, and then uh, putting it into, into the park itself. Also one, uh, also got the lead platinum, but I think we can be, given the scenario now, we can be a bit more aggressive in terms of the low carbon targets as well. So this has been completed recently. Where we are trying to affect change now, we are also doing the new capital city in, in Indonesia. Um, of course, even internally, there are questions on, are you going to be building a rainforest areas, et cetera. We had a lot of pressure internally, whether we were helping them hit the right targets. We, there was a target for 100% renewables. 
the land to be developed is at, at the moment main almost all agricultural land or plantation uh, forest. Um, so we want to make sure that targets such as um, planting, etc., is coming back higher than what what we what we replaced previously. So that uh, this project has a hundred percent renewable uh, target, mainly from solar, uh, huge solar plant outside. But there's also challenges within the site because if you know East Kalimantan is mainly coal industry. So we are up against a lot of challenges in terms of uh, the capital city setting the standard on not using coal as an energy supply source. Various other zero carbon buildings uh, we've done. We've done a zero carbon building in Hong Kong for the Building Construction in, uh, Authority. Uh, more as a showcase on what can possibly uh, be done when we push the, bo the boundary. At that time, I think it wasn't cost efficient because solar was expensive, but now solar has dropped drastically uh, and making it a lot viable as well. The Bennington Zero Energy Development in the UK, there's been a bad Z. There's been quite a number of B sort of projects in the UK as well because of the top-down target to reduce carbon. We've tried things like uh, um, algae on the facade, so that as you push through algae through the facade and then it gets activated, bioactivated, you use, reuse the, the sludge from the algae and then that gets fed into a biogas plant in the basement. And this was uh, built in Hamburg in, in Germany. As we try different things, we're also working with the Economic Development Board here in Singapore. Uh, as a, we have a city, future cities hub program to see areas of uh, innovation we are able to work on together and also increase the knowledge within, within uh, the industry and Arab itself. So for this coming year, the focus is on energy, low carbon and climate change. With that, I think uh, despite some interesting projects we've done, um, a lot of things we always pull different disciplines together to make sure that the, the approach is an uh, integrated uh, manner. We have energy guys sitting together with our water guys, with our urban planners and architects uh, brainstorming and seeing how, we, how far we can push the boundary. Um, I think it has to be looked at multiple levels from, from energy supply to how we strategize from a macro perspective and city level down to infrastructure and buildings, as well as personally our own consumption patterns on reducing uh, demand as well. I still think definitely based on the, the, the targets you've seen and the examples cities are heading towards the Paris Agreement, we're not getting there anywhere near where we have to push our, in terms of energy, energy and carbon targets. I think when we started talking about um, carbon and sustainability in the late 90s, early 2000s, we are looking at about 350, 360 parts per million. Now we're at 420. And even if we stop all development <laughs> and making it sure it's zero now, the carbon emission, the carbon um, in the air is still going to continue uh, on to about 500 part, I think. So we have to get there a lot faster. Challenges abound, but also we'll, I know from a commercial perspective, we still have to be sort of profitable, but regardless, I think both at the policy level and what we're able to do commercially, I think we just have to be a lot more aggressive faster. With that, uh, that's the end of my slides. Thanks a lot, Kelly. And I'll pass but you on to Simon. Thank you, Tony. Um, I, the holistic and, and very systemic approach that Arup is um, taking to all of your infrastructure projects is, is really interesting. And I, I really like that about your company. Um, we're gonna switch tax to uh, Dr. Simon Skillerbeek, uh, who's gonna look at it from a really interesting technological side. An academic entrepreneur who is an assistant professor of strategic management at the Lee Kong Chan School of Business at Singapore Management University. His research focuses on digitization, innovation, and sustainability. In addition, he founded the Global Mangrove Trust, which uses blockchain technology and remote sensing to support mangrove reforestation. This is also in addition to his social entrepreneurship of integrating 
positive impact into every business transaction by his other startup, Henprit. Can't wait to hear your views on the just transition. Simon, please. Thank you very much. You should all be able to see some of my slides right now. Um, let me just get rid of these uh, annotation things. So, and so what I'll talk about for the next couple of minutes is um, this idea that I've been developing at university and then also more and more in practice um, with my two startups, so Handprint and Global Mangrove Trust, um, which is uh, digital sustainability. So I firmly believe that digital technologies are driving a sustainability revolution, increasingly so. And as Tony said in his talk, um, we all know that digital is an enabler of sustainability. And so the question I'm going to try to answer in this talk is why? Um, so this is some information about me, um, which has been said. And so for me, what, we've been, what I've been researching the last, let's say, four or five years is this idea that digitization and sustainability as two very powerful trends have been converging. And um, in a variety of academic work that I've published and hope to publish soon, I've been trying to explore what is really behind this uh, convergence. And so what we've done is like we've defined, and so we as a, a couple of colleagues and I, so we've defined digital sustainability as all the types of organizational activities that advance the sustainable development goals through the deployment of technologies that create, use, transmit, or source electronic data. And, um, and so these activities obviously are being taken up by more and more organizations, um, including startups, but including, of course, big organizations like Arab and also by governments. And but I'm going to specifically focus on uh, for-profit businesses, and so not government or NGOs. And so what we have seen is that three things are happening at the same time, and they're actually um, exacerbated or reinforced often by the pandemic. So one is the expansion of corporate purpose uh, towards the inclusion of much more uh, social and uh, environmental goals. Uh, secondly, is the enablement of what we call economies of collective action, which means that digitization has made it much cheaper to act as a, as a group to come together and to coordinate transactions to coordinate economic activity and other types of activity in a non-hierarchical way, which has been which is proving to be very useful. And third is the digitization is enabling the appropriation of public value. I'll explain that more in the next couple of slides. So what do we see when you think about like purpose? So purpose is a very big word. It's kind of a buzzword of the last couple of years. Um, organizations now all have to be purpose-driven. But what we see in reality is that purpose-driven organizations truly outperform their competitors. And the results are very stark. Like they have much faster growth, up to three times faster. They have much more loyal customers and they have higher employee retention. They even become more innovative. And so, and, and what is interesting about this is that at the same time that we see all of these benefits of purpose, we also see that the meaning of purpose is really broadening significantly. Specifically, what we see is that uh, companies this day and age, especially if they want to attract top talent, need to have a purpose that goes beyond profit maximization and explicitly includes uh, social and environmental goals. An example of this would be uh, Nike taking a very public stance on the Black Lives Matter movement and actually increasing its uh, profitability uh, despite the pandemic. And so at the same time, of course, companies have been digitizing for a long time. And if uh, it's true that these, uh, that purpose has become much more uh, uh, centered around sustainability activities, it is very logical that uh, companies will also use these digital technologies in order to tackle some of these sustainability challenges. At the same time, with the pandemic, what we've seen is a shift in public awareness. So my um, public awareness around sustainability. So of course, the pandemic has been uh, dreadful for so many things and for human health and so. Uh, but what we've seen as well is that people and especially younger generations uh, have become much more aware of their physical interconnectedness. And so what you said, global trade uh, made us all economically interconnected and the internet 
uh, made us somewhat socially interconnected. Um, what the pandemic has done is it made us physically interconnected. And we were finally realized this. And what that means uh, that they influence. Uh, climate change, all of those kind of things, and that they can maybe do something about this. And, it, and the digital technologies have, have, of course, been important in uh, kind of fostering that awareness, but have also at the same time uh, made it possible to, uh, uh, made it cheaper to uh, act together, to do things together in ways that previously were not possible. So if you look at like how they've, uh, digitization has kind of transformed the way we can store knowledge uh, in, the in, in the cloud, like open source activities, but also the way we create knowledge now with like centralized computing, machine learning, uh, and even something like Wikipedia, which is much older, which is also a decentralized digital, digitally enabled way of creating knowledge, which we all know now is um, potentially the most accurate source of, of truth in the world, uh, would be Wikipedia. And um, with the advent of blockchain, um, digitization has also changed the way we kind of exchange knowledge or exchange things of of value, uh, which is going to prove to be uh, very, very uh, influential, I think, in the next uh, years, especially once we solve the high energy costs that are associated with some blockchain technologies. And then finally, and potentially most importantly, like when we're thinking about um, the capitalist system, you can have uh, an expansion of purpose where companies are going to be more aware, like, oh, we need to do something for sustainability. Great. We can have a lowering of barriers of, uh, of taking action because digitization makes it easier for smaller and bigger organizations and individuals to become part of this uh, sustainability movement. But it doesn't really work if you can't uh, also create, generate profit because in a capitalist system, this is uh, the key driver. And so what's interesting is that digitization is beginning to solve the tragedy of the commons. And so the tragedy of the commons, for those who are not familiar with it, um, is the idea or, or the reality that if you put um, goods in public ownership, so you don't privatize ownership, that there is a significant like problem of incentive, like who is going to take care of them? And so the famous example from uh, the economist Coase, who came up with this idea, or and, and Hardin, who talked about this uh, in the 60s and in the 30s, is this idea of like, oh, if you have a grass field and you have 100 uh, different farmers around this, uh, or sheep farmers, and every, every sheep farmer has one sheep, and they can just, and every sheep grazes on the grass, everything is fine. But the moment someone says like, well, actually there's enough grass, there's only a hundred sheep, um, I can buy a second sheep, everything is still fine. As long as the, the grass field is well kept, it's not a problem. But once every farmer starts adding more and more sheep, suddenly we don't have grass anymore, and then everyone suffers. And this tends to happen because there is no ownership of the of the, of the commons, uh, like the, of the grass field. And so everyone has a private incentive to increase their use of the commons without really having a collective incentive to take care of it. And so what's interesting with digitization is that we see organizations finding solutions for this uh, by a combination of lots of complex technologies, right? So like, for instance, remote sensing, remote sensing, uh, machine learning, and then uh, tokenization of of a specific uh, public goods in order to create private ownership. And so a very concrete example is actually something that my organization, uh, the Global Mangrove Trust, is working on together with a variety of other partners, is this idea that we can, uh, we can tokenize uh, the benefits that are associated with investing in forests. Right? So if we invest in forests, typically there you're investing in a public good. Um, but people that um, the countries in which those forests uh, need to be regrown, let's say uh, Indonesia or, or Myanmar, where you have like mangrove forests that need to be regrown uh, or better preserved, they don't have the financial resources, but companies have an incentive to invest in that as long as they can legitimately claim that the carbon that's being absorbed is theirs, right? So they can make a claim about carbon absorption that people believe, whereas while at the same time creating a public good. 
And so that's what we see happening. And really, this is becoming, uh, this is enabled by, by digitization. And, it, um, and while this, these kind of solutions existed before, now with digitization, it becomes much more scalable to, um, to do these kind of things, uh, like tokenizing uh, private benefits. So the claim that you can make, which is good for your reputation as a company, that I've absorbed carbon or even I've taken plastic uh, from the ocean or I'm responsible for this coral reef reconstruction or I'm responsible for creating, for supporting one hour of education. We need to have these things, um, uh, we need to digitize uh, these, these positive activities in order so that companies can lay claim on them, can benefit from them, um, and then it aligns with the capitalist system. And I think digitization is really doing a lot of wonderful things in, in this space. So in summary, so we see this digitization influencing uh, the mainstreaming of sustainability integration into the profit agenda of corporations, uh, reducing the barriers to participation, making it much easier for uh, especially smaller companies to become part of the solution. And many small uh, SMEs um, maybe want to do something around sustainability, but find it extremely difficult, don't have the resources, don't have the knowledge, and so are by default kind of excluded from being part of the solution. Digitalization is helping those organizations as well as individuals to become part of the solution and then all of this is kind of underpinned by this increasing ability um, to privatize uh, value that is created uh, in public goods and by this privatization you create incentives for organizations uh, to invest in public goods that they don't really own as long as they can lay claim to some of the benefits that these public goods create this i think is a very important trend so what are some of the examples so what I mentioned before, um, with my organization, Global Mangrove Trust, we have set up a partnership here in Singapore with Zilliqa, an NUS um, spin-off on the blockchain, uh, with Kumi Analytics, a, uh, a company that does uh, machine learning based on uh, spatial information data, and uh, Marek Spectrum, um, one of the biggest commodity brokers in the world. And the goal of this partnership is to bring blue carbon to the market in a very new way. So the partnership uh, is setting up special purpose vehicles. Uh, we're now in conversations here with the monetary authority um, to set up these uh, special purpose vehicles to invest in uh, mangrove reforestation um, and then to uh, tokenize the carbon that is being absorbed by, this, by these mangroves. Mangroves are incredible trees because they absorb up to 10 times more carbon uh, than terrestrial forests. And they typically also exist on a, a type of land that is not very useful for agriculture. Um, and they have lots of other benefits in terms of uh, protecting local communities from, from storms and from tsunamis and from cyclones and uh, improve, improving the, the soil and the stability of the soil so that uh, islands like Bintan stop sinking if you grow uh, more mangroves on them. So loads of benefits for the local community, but the company that is investing in this or that is sponsoring this only really cares about the fact that they want to lay claim to the private benefits. Like they want to say, I'm carbon neutral or ideally I'm climate positive. Like I'm absorbing 10 times more carbon than my, I'm responsible for uh, through investing in this, in this process. But at the same time, they're creating a public good that is um, incredibly powerful and uh, has much, much bigger uh, benefits than pure carbon. Um, so with Handprint, so with my other organization, what we've set up is a, a digital platform that enables companies to integrate positive impact into a variety of their business processes. So the first tool we've built is, is a couple of e-commerce plugins, as, as displayed on the slide, where companies can just um, go, to, uh, go to our website, download these plugins and integrate them into the checkout process of their organization. And uh, the plugin automatically uh, reroutes part of the money that is normally spent on the cart to a specific uh, cause, a specific impact project uh, that the company selects. So that could be a reforestation project, that could be a coral project, that could be an education project, a water project, a sanitation project, all kinds of projects that align with the sustainable development goals. You can now integrate into your sales 
and as a consequence also tie your sustainability activities in a strategic way to your business growth because it's only when your growth genuinely becomes good for the world that you can assign that you can align the incentives that we need as a capitalist system to solve this problem as long as companies do sustainability as something that is secondary which by and large is still what happens especially in europe but uh, in most of the world, we can't solve this problem. We need to make sure that um, creating the creation of positive impact is intrinsic to uh, the company's uh, KPIs and the company's uh, goals. So this works for sales, but we can do this with lots of other uh, types of uh, digital uh, KPIs as well. So we're talking with ride hailing companies to integrate positive impact into ride hailing. That seems very obvious. We can do it as well uh, with food delivery. And we're talking with, uh, with banks to create it in bank accounts or in credit cards. We're talking with hotels to create it in bookings, with uh, travel agencies to create it in, uh, to embed it in experiences, any kind of uh, KPI that is measured digitally can be integrated with a, with a positive impact. And these right. things are truly enabled by digital technology. Simon, Simon I'm going to, oh, perfect, perfect. Good timing, good timing, Simon. Um, we do, we are running a little bit short on time for the Q&A and we've got a number that have already been um, uploaded to Poll EV. So just a reminder, so we're going to be moving into the Q&A. Uh, there's the poll EV in the chat, and you can upload uh, or up, upvote um, some of the questions. We have uh, a lot of really good um, questions that have already been submitted. Um, Tony, I'm going to pass this one over to you. Um, globally, how can we incentivize companies to reduce reliance on carbon energy when a majority of their operations are located in nations with less stringent climate regulations? So from your perspective in the private sector, your thoughts, please. Um... I think we have to look at a bigger picture, right? We have to get to a target drastically fast. Corporation and politics are not exactly <laughs> the best way forward. Politicians, especially in Asia, it's such short term, right? Every five years, they're changing governments, etc. So their policies are more short term. Corporation, obviously, is targeting profits. And the guys you really have to target are the oil and gas industry. And then they have set up things like the like, um, Center of Climate Initiative. I think the, the top 12, 13 oil guys in the world have set this up in the UK. But when you get a bunch of guys that are retiring in five years, they're not going to get anywhere fast. So I, for me on the personal side as well is that Despite, it's not a fight between the renewables and the oil and gas and coal guys, but giving them an option to transition into non-fossil fuel products. So we are brainstorming a few areas. We've seen guys proposing uh, things like trans-ocean pipe, plastic pipelines. So you get the benefits of moving fresh water from areas of water abundance to areas of uh, arid land. And, and the amount of plastic pipes required allows a market to be created for the oil gas guys to transition into something they're still making money on, but not heading towards fossil fuel production. So we see radical innovations uh, like this. So I think the, the question <laughs> is, yeah, we can do some things to push at the top-down policy level, but it's not easy. But not as easy as countries like uh, China or Singapore, which has a strong, stable government and able to have that as a driver. So I think, unfortunately, the situation we see in most countries in the world is the challenge of short-term uh, targets for for politicians. <laughs> Unfortunate, but that's yep. the current situation always a mismatch between the politics and how nature actually functions. Yep. Um, Simon, we've got a specific question for you. If you can briefly answer, what are your thoughts about the crypto market and its environmental costs? Um, I think it's solvable. Um, so the, the only problem with crypto and environmentalism is really uh, proof of work, uh, which is the consensus algorithm or the consensus system that is used by blockchain, by, by Bitcoin, and by still quite a few other uh, 
uh, blockchain technologies. I think over time, maybe even for Bitcoin, we're going to solve this by moving to another consensus algorithm. Once we do so, the environmental costs go down a lot. Um, but it's going to take some time. And of course, in the meanwhile, uh, I think Bitcoin itself uh, yeah, kind of emits more or is responsible for more electricity consumption than Argentina by now. So uh, there is there is a big problem, but I don't think that means we should um, get rid of the technology altogether. There is a, lots of technologies take a long time to come into their own. Um, it's not going to be different, I think, with blockchain. This is a transformative technology that is going to change everything about commerce and about um, even how we interact as, as people. It's going to be as influential as the internet. Um, uh, it just takes some time. And I have faith that it's going to, uh, that the environmental footprint is going to be reduced massively. Good, yeah, interesting answer. Um, okay, we have time for one more question and this one's gonna to be to you, Melissa. Um, is Singapore, if Singapore is able to provide low carbon energy, can this be a competitive advantage for us given that the electricity prices are higher? Um, thanks, Kelly. Yeah, so I saw this question quite early on and I was thinking about it. I know time is really short. I did want to say that um, I think these are, are really important questions to ask ourselves. Um, certainly, people have been calling for the carbon tax to be increased, for instance, in Singapore, in order to drive energy efficiency, among other things. And, and, and um, one of the, the key trade-offs, if you will, is that uh, obviously power companies are going to pass through the cost to um, uh, people, right? And uh, it's possibly regressive because um, those who, who uh, are needier um, could end up paying more um, for uh, climate change, essentially, right? Um, uh, when, we, when we make sure that the cost is, is appropriate for um, the pollution that we are putting out. Um, because of, of time, I would say, um, I think that uh, Minister Chan Chun Singh actually lays out some of these trade-offs very clearly in uh, a podcast that he did um, on climate conversations with Channel News Asia. I would encourage everyone um, who is interested in trade-offs, um, interested in the Singapore Green Plan, particularly on the energy reset um, pillar of the Green Plan to go and uh, listen to the 30-minute podcast. Um, he covers it quite quite. Um, broadly, I, I guess. Um, so because time is time is quite short, I know you, you need to wrap up. Yeah. There's, I think this conversation can definitely go for another hour. Or so given the really great questions that have also been submitted, um, Tony, there's a lot of interest in the questions about the LG facade. So um, perhaps we can follow up and, and get some questions and then follow up with everybody afterwards. Um, but that, that is all the time that we have for today. Thank you to Solve, Cli Solve Climate by 2030 initiative. Uh, Mr. Tony Chan, Ms. Melissa Lowe, Dr. Simon Skillabeek, thank you so much for your time as well as everybody who joined us today.